Tonight, I want to do a teaching on financial dominion. And the reason is because Jesus' death was not only to save us from sin and from the messianic judgment. Jesus' death was also designed to bring us circumstantial deliverance. And because this is the case, in fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, the Bible said concerning our Lord Jesus, he said, rich as he was, he became poor that you and I may be made rich. And so the same price that was paid for the forgiveness of your sins, the same price that was paid for the restoration of your health is the price that was paid for your financial deliverance. And so that should bring you two basic realizations. Number one, you must realize that financial prosperity is a right, not a privilege. Because if your salvation was a right procured you by Christ, then your prosperity is also a right. Believers are not offensive about issues of prosperity because they don't know that the power to get wealth has been committed to them and whether they remain poor or rich is their choice. And so they go about begging, hoping that things will work. Nothing works in this realm. Things are made to work. The earth realm is the realm of manifestation. And so the earth realm is actually a product of the manifestation of the activity of spirit behind the scene. So everything you see were carefully and deliberately worked out. Nothing is a coincidence. And so if you know that financial prosperity is your right, then you will wake up and contend for it. Many times people have faith for healing. People have faith that their sins are forgiven them but they have little or no faith for their financial prosperity. And so you find them begging and living in pity, looking for sympathy and hoping that things will change. When you have the right revelation, the same energy and commitment with which you put in to live a holy life is the energy you will put in to live a financially victorious life. Because what was done for your healing is the same thing that was done for your prosperity. Number two, when you know this, you will hate poverty. There are many people today that hate sin. In fact, when you say something that looks as if you are encouraging sin, they start fighting you. They have a strong defense against sin and iniquity. But when it comes to poverty, they accommodate it because they think poverty is part of our everyday living. God hates poverty as much as he hates sin. This is why the price that was paid for your sins is the same price paid for your poverty. And poverty became part of the human race the same day sin became part of the human race. The first man God created, he created in abundance. The day the man was condemned to death was the same day he was condemned to poverty. And so the day restoration for holy living came, that day restoration for financial prosperity also came. Why is this important? Number three, the kingdom of God cannot go forward without prosperity. Many people think prayer and evangelism is what makes the kingdom to spread abroad. It's a joke. I can tell you that there are many prayer warriors today with the right message to set our world on fire who are living in obscurity because they have no money to give amplification to what God is doing with them. In Zechariah chapter 1 verse 17, it says, cry out. So it is not a subject to, to sweep under the carpet. It says to cry out and say to my people, my kingdom through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. Because the devil is aware of this. He doesn't only fight your prayer life. The revival ongoing currently we think is just a revival of prayer. If the church is poor, where we preach the highest revelation, nobody will hear it. I told you already, the TV ministry that they are talking about didn't just come by tonguing. It came by hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
There are many people with the right revelation, the right manifestation of the spirit, but nobody hears them. He says, so cry out and tell the body of Christ that my kingdom through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. Remember, the church is not just poor because she doesn't know what to do. There is a force that is holding people down in poverty. Make no mistakes about it. You are not poor because you were born into a poor home. You are not poor because things are not working in your country. There is a force that holds men back in poverty and in obscurity. So after he said to cry out, he went further in verse 18 to let us know. The prophet was gazing upon Judah and Israel and suddenly he saw four horns that emerged. The moment he said, let there be prosperity, the horns appeared. To let you know that the body was not poor because of a lack of wisdom. The body was poor because there was a horn activating that protocol. And so when the prophet rose and said, my kingdom through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, immediately four horns emerged. And he said, what are these horns? And he said, these are the horns that have scattered Jerusalem and Judea that no man did lift up the head. That means the reason people cannot lift up their head is because there are forces holding them back. And the reason those forces are holding them down is because the forces know that when they are lifted up, the kingdom will move. For you to leave your house to come here every Sunday is because you love God. And if you have a million dollars today, at least 10 million will go to church. The devil knows. And so in order for the vision of the church not to be advanced, he will rather keep you in poverty. Because if he allows you to be rich, the kingdom by implication will be expanded. And so the prophet said he saw four carpenters. And he said, what have these carpenters come to do? And he said, these are the carpenters that have come to scatter the horns that have held down Jerusalem and Judea. That means it's a battle of thrones. The issue of poverty is not something to take with levity. It's actually a warfare. Because the devil knows when you prosper, the kingdom prospers. And because he doesn't want the kingdom to prosper, he will hold you down in captivity. So fire is not just for speaking in tongues. Fire is actually to also rise up and make all the money that can be made and spend it until the gospel is free to all creatures and in every territory of the world. Number four, the reason why you need to be prosperous is because the Bible clearly stated, it said, tell them that are rich in this world, 1 Timothy 6, 17, to be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God that giveth unto every man liberally that he may enjoy. So God is interested in your enjoyment. This is why he gives you wealth. He said he giveth unto every man liberally that he may enjoy. Listen to this. We are willing to suffer for the kingdom, but suffering is not God's ultimate verdict for you. If you have to go through trials and peril for the kingdom, it is welcome. But it doesn't mean you should live in abject poverty because you are a kingdom man. In fact, the church is typified with so much poverty that the poorest of rats are called church rats. Because it is believed that the rat in the house of a wealthy man, once in a while can find something to eat. But the rat in church, even the documents are not available to eat to, 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 eat, to chew. They, all the documents are locked up. Even paper that is no longer relevant. They are trying to use it for something because there's no money to buy paper. But the paradigm is about to shift because the wealthiest of people are about to come out of the church of Jesus Christ. So number one, you must be rich because the price paid for your salvation is the same price paid for your prosperity. Number two, you must be rich because poverty is not God's plan for you. Number three, you must be rich because the kingdom cannot expand until you are rich. And number four, you must be rich because God built you for abundant life. When Adam was created, he put him in the garden of Eden. There was no lack there. Make no mistakes about it. If you can't pray in an air-conditioned room, nobody should deceive you that you can pray in a hot room. It is not the room that makes you pray. You pray because there's a hunger in your spirit. And if you have genuine hunger, it's better to pray where there is AC. <laughs> there is so much religiosity and so much lies, even with preachers. The people that tell you poverty is our inheritance, go and check their bank accounts. Some of them have schools, 
Some of them have investments. Some of them have a lot of assets everywhere. The man who is telling you that you have to be poor, check the suit he's wearing. And then you wonder if this gospel is only for others and not for the preacher. Let me tell you something. Wealth, riches is God's plans for you. The reason we tell people not to emphasize this all the time is because we are careful not to turn their attention to mammon. But it doesn't mean it is a sin to live in wealth. There is nothing wrong with having money. It is loving money that is evil. Even Jesus moved about with money everywhere he went to. In fact, he didn't have need for a bank. He carried it with him. Praise God. These things look simple. But I tell you, the reason many people are frustrated in their service and worship of God is because of the quagmires of life that money should answer that they don't have to deal with. The Bible says, money answereth all things. Because if there's no money, your Christianity will be a difficult journey. Praise the name of the Lord. Are you learning something already? I said it to help you make, your, make up your mind for money. Because we need it as individuals. We need it as families. We need it as ministries. We need it as systems. We need it as a nation. That's how the world is designed. And everyone who walks in the power of the Holy Spirit must have wisdom for wealth creation. It is not spirituality to be poor. It is actually a lack of spiritual understanding to be poor. In Hosea chapter 4 verse 6b, he said, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. In Isaiah chapter 5 verse 13, he said, my people are taken into captivity for the lack of knowledge. You know, many times people think when they come to have encounters with God, they should only shout, pray, cry, fall on the floor. My brother, that's one part of it. There's another part of encounter that empowers you to make money. And when God wants his kingdom to go to Saudi Arabia, you stand up and say, I will pay for it. It's not every dimension that takes people to the floor. There's another dimension that takes people to the bank. They are all called revival. And the Jesus that sets men on fire is the same Jesus that empowers men. Praise the name of the Lord. Are you ready to learn something tonight? And so because this is a warfare, you require empowerment. You are not wealthy just because you are smart. Smartness is one of the credentials. You are not wealthy just because you are diligent. Diligence is one of the credentials. You are wealthy because you are empowered. In Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18, he said, you shall remember the Lord thy God. It is him that giveth thee power to get wealth. That means the ability to get wealth is a power. So when you see somebody getting wealth, he's not just getting wealth because he's smart. You will be shocked how many smart men are in this world. In fact, the wealthy actually hire the smart to work for them. When you go to the house of the wealthy man, you will find many smart men there working. Many diligent men working. In fact, they pay them to work for them. The guy who is really wealthy is not just smart. There is an empowerment he has acquired. And this empowerment comes from the spirit realm. Praise the name of the Lord. And because this requires empowerment, there are two things you must subject yourself to in order to walk in financial dominion. Number one, you must walk under divine instructions. Number two, you must have access to mysteries. These are the two things that truly empower men for wealth in this kingdom. Walking by divine instructions and walking by the mysteries of the kingdom. If you have no access to mysteries, you may be doing everything right, you will still be poor. And if you violate instructions, you will negate the things that are meant for your advantage. That's why I pity people that listen to gullible men without results, who just sit on the internet and toast them to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Before I go further, I need to let you know that you are not just a businessman. You are a kingdom man doing business. That means the laws that apply to you are different from the laws that applies to the businessman who is not in the kingdom. The businessman who is not in the kingdom can take bribe to be rich. The businessman who is not in the kingdom can cut corners to make up for his life and for his living. 
you are not permitted to take bribe. You are not permitted to steal. You are not permitted to cut corners. That is why in addition to diligent, the diligent requirement that both you and the man of the world are applying, you need to find the mysteries that make for your advantage. Because that man who is selling pure water with you on the same street may have a dibia that he sacrifices virgins to. He will not tell you that. And so he comes up and when the mysteries of the kingdom are given to you, you go and listen to the man who is not in the kingdom, who does so many other things that you don't do and is prospering and you think you are making a headway in life. There's a funny man from the east that woke up the other time and splashed a lot of money and because he spent a lot of money to bury his mother, he felt he had become a mentor to the church and began to tell people how to go about life in the spirit. What he doesn't know is that all of us may have money, but our sources are different. And because our sources are different, the instructions we obey and the mysteries we follow are different. He may be making his money by a means we don't know. And he can splash this the way he wants. But that he has money does not mean he has the right to teach us how to make money. You can share one, one million for people. And the pastor is telling people to give. You are walking by two different rules because you are in two different kingdoms. We have mysteries and instructions that give us an advantage in life. And we don't know what you serve. And whatever it is that you serve may be giving you an advantage by whatever means you are doing. There are people who are getting rich today by womanizing. There are people who are getting rich today by going to sleep in a coffin. They will not tell you that on Facebook. And that is why you cannot just open up your spirit to somebody who has no stand with God to come and counsel you. There are two things that make us wealthy in this kingdom. Number one are the instructions of God and number two are the mysteries of the kingdom. The Bible said, talking about the mysteries of the kingdom, it said the secrets of the Lord, it belongs to them that fear him. Proverbs 25 verse 14 and it said he will show them his covenants. The secrets of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. That means one of the ways to become wealthy in this kingdom is to reverence God. It doesn't begin with the job you are doing. It begins with reverence for God because the wisdom and the strategies that you require to go ahead in life will only be committed to you to the degree that you fear the Lord. The secrets of God. This is why we need to have access to mysteries. Because the way these things work for us is different from the way it works for the people of the world. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, he said, project it. The secret things belong to God. He said, but the things that are revealed, they belong to us and to our children forever. That means the way we make progress in this kingdom is by secrets. The second way we make progress in this kingdom is by instructions. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13 and 15, he said, until I come, he said, give attendance to reading, to exhortation and to doctrine. He said in verse 15, give thyself wholly to these things that thy profiting may be made manifest to all. That means the business with the word of God is one of God's strategy for empowering you. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, he said, all scriptures are given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And they are profitable. That means every scripture is profitable. And the scriptures are the instruction manual of the kingdom. That means the instructions of God are for profit. And he went further to explain to us the four dimensions of profit that we get. He said for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction, and for correction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good works. In Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, he said, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Thou shalt meditate upon it day and night to see that you do what is written therein. He said, Then you shall make thy way prosperous and have good success. That means the instructions of God comes to move us ahead. The instructions of God comes to profit us. His instructions are not just burdensome. Every instruction God gives you has an advantage attached to it. You may just not have seen it. But many times when you are done obeying, 
things just begins to happen and yourself cannot trace where these things are coming from. They are actually because you walked in obedience. So two ways to be wealthy in this kingdom is to have access to mysteries and is to have access to instructions. I'm going to give you some kingdom oriented instructions tonight that when you apply, you will see your life move forward progressively. Listen, we can impact people make decrease over people by the anointing and they are shifted. But for them to walk in the blessings it's beyond an impartation. For you to walk in the blessing is beyond a prophecy. To walk in the blessing you must have to find mysteries that you live by and you must have to secure instructions that define your way of life. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. There are three things I will talk about tonight which embodies both instructions and mysteries. And I beg you, listen to them and apply them. You will never regret it. Listen to them and apply them. You know, John said the things that were from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. He said, that's what we commit to you. I have seen a measure of these things I'm teaching you. I beg you, believe these things and apply them. Many times when I want to give people instruction, I deliberately tune down. So they will hear it, they will write it down, and they will practice it. Because many times when the energy is intense, people really don't hear anything. They just flow by the motion. And when they step out, there is nothing they live with. I'm about to give you instructions that will change your life. Wherever it is you are starting from, be diligent. And as you practice it over time, you will be shocked the outcome. You will be shocked. There are three things that makes for wealth in this kingdom. Number one is to walk with your hands. I know many times when we talk about prosperity, we begin with giving. If you are only dealing on this subject, on the plane of giving, you are standing on one foot. You will be drowned. You can never go far in this kingdom if you don't have something you are doing with your hands. That idea of telling you, just give and you will prosper, is a scam. Everybody prospering in this kingdom is doing something. And I will show you from scripture, the people you quote, go and check their life. They, do so, they did something. Paul the apostle, for example, who is the apostle of grace, he did something, he counseled the church to do something, he taught doing something with your hands. Because when you have nothing to do, you make it difficult for God to bless you. It becomes easy for God to bless you when you have something to do. There is no spirit that can prosper a man who is doing nothing. The only thing a spirit may use you to do is to produce one that through you. So they may get you to do something that obviously looks as if it cannot prosper you. And while you are yet doing that thing, they begin to blow you open. But by all means, you must do something. Without doing something, there can be no prosperity in view. And when you are doing something, there is a how to do whatever it is that you are doing. In fact, when you look at the life of Paul, who is the arch apostle of grace, he was a workaholic. So Paul prospered not just by grace. Paul prospered by walking. In Acts chapter 20 verse 34, Paul was speaking to the church and he said, Ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessity and to them that were with me. He said, this my very hands. That's an apostle. He didn't sit down idle and say, I'm an apostle of Jesus. People are bringing offering and tithe. He said, these hands, these hands, they have labored to provide for my necessity. And if an apostle of Jesus, who is legitimately qualified to receive offerings and prophetic seeds, have to put his own hands to work, it means you are joking, idling away. We have a generation of people today who just lock themselves up in the cave. And they pray in tongues for eight months. And when they come out, they come out and become fake prophets and scammers. 
because no matter how spiritual they are, they cannot deny the fact that they need clothes to wear and something to eat. And when they can no longer get those things, they close their eyes and say an angel is talking to them. And they say, bring what you have. You are having this in your pocket. Bring it out. You are a thief. <laughs> you are a terrible thief. And if you don't repent, the wrath of God will soon come on you for bringing reproach to the name of Jesus Christ. I walked with my hands. And you have to start from somewhere. Listen, I had a master's degree. There was nothing to do and God forced me to stay in Makodi. I was in Makodi for five years. While I was in Makodi, I was teaching in a school earning 25,000 naira with master's degree. Because I know, instead of lying down at home and prophesying and praying in tongues, hoping that one day God will lift me and start giving me millions, it is important I did something at the time. And so for five years, I was earning 25,000. And because I was earning something, I had no need to beg anybody. I had money to pay for my transport. I had money to eat what I needed to eat. And with that 25,000 naira, I registered for my PhD. And I was doing it. I was lecturing in the Bible school and I was preaching as an itinerant preacher. Many people lazy around and because they have tendency of scamming, they sit down idle, telling people that they are men of God. This is why the body is not experiencing the level of dignity and power she should have amongst the nations of the world. Paul the apostle walked with his hands. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 12, Paul was talking about himself and he said, I labor, walking with my own hands, being revived, with blessed, being persecuted, we suffered it. That means even in the times of persecution, Paul was still walking. Hope you know he was a tent maker. The man is a tent maker. As I'm talking to you, I have lands that I bought from my savings. And when it goes up, I will sell them. I'm not here preaching. I, that's why I can go anywhere and talk anything God puts in my heart. I didn't come for your honorarium. You will never have integrity if you have nothing doing. People can manipulate you. I went to preach somewhere because the man saw somebody drop crutches. He came to me and said, uh, 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 the, the, I should call for a seed. I said, I don't call for seeds. I'm a revivalist. I come to set men on fire. If you want people to sow seed, teach them about the covenant of giving. When they learn it, they will give by revelation and by the leading of the Holy Spirit. They will not be coerced to give. And if you have not taught them that, I will not coerce them to give because if they give, there will be no reward. And if there's no reward, they will become frustrated. Hope you know what people can do when they see somebody drop crutches and start working. They can go and take their house rent and come and give and say, no, the level of anointing I saw here, something will happen. But they are not doing it from revelation or from the leading of the Holy Spirit. And after three months, when the landlord ejects them, they will come and say, God is not faithful. Because we will make many become atheists by not teaching them the truth. If you are here today and you are idling away, you can never prosper no matter the prophecies we give you. You must get something doing with your hands. Because when God comes to bless you, there must be a contact place. Paul walked with his hand. In Philippians chapter 4 verse 12, he said, I have learned to abound and to abase. He said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I have learned to abound and to abase. The guy knew how to survive in Peri. Paul will come to a city to preach. And while he's in that city, he's making tents. He met Priscilla and Aquila in the market. He didn't meet them in the synagogue. He met them at his working place. Don't find yourself idling away. Because somebody told you that you will deliver the nations. That you are an apostle to America. And then you are sleeping, you are seeing dollars. <laughs> Number two, Paul prescribed walking with your hands. He didn't only walk, he prescribed it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 to 12, he said, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not walk, neither should he eat. It's not every service that is a fire service. 
There's a service that is an instruction service. He said, if you will not walk, don't eat. And in verse 12, he said, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. That's what he called them. Those who are doing nothing. That's why they loaf around and they are every gossip they are in it. If you walk for six to eight hours a day, you will not have energy for gossip. Because you know if you are not at work by 7.15, you will be queried. And when you are coming back from work by four o'clock, the remaining hours you have, you will think where to use it. It's because you woke up around 10 and you have nowhere to go to. That's why you can call somebody and say, did you hear what they are saying about matter? You are, you are an idle man. The devil is walking inside you. You are a workshop. When you start walking, you will not have time for those things. He said, now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they walk and eat their own bread. Does this mean Paul is not aware that God gives favor? He knows. But there's got to be a point of contact. I know you may not have a job yet. Whatever it is that you are, you are, you can do, keep start doing it. And if there is nothing you can do, go and register for skill acquisition. Learn something and start doing it. Some people come and say, Kai, their work is, 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 is affecting their prayer altar. They, ah, they can't pray. They can't pray. Since you started working, when was the last time you prayed for six hours in a day? So they stop working and they increase the time of idleness. And even those who are working, there is nobody working on earth that have not at least six to eight hours to spare. There is not one person. Even presidents of nations take time to nap. They take time to go fishing. They take time to stroll around. And World Health Organization said five hours of sleep is healthy. That means you are supposed to sleep by 12 and wake up by 5 a.m. And I don't know the work you are doing that you walk up to 11 midnight. Even if you close from work by 8 p.m., you have four hours between 8 and 12. And you have one hour between 6, 7 before you go to work. There is nobody that have an excuse that his work is affecting his prayer life. Your hunger have died. Go and find hunger. Idleness in the church. You come to a place, you find 1,000 graduates. All of them wake up in the morning. Oh, 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 oh. From morning to night. And they do it for, for four years. I'm not against it if God sent you there for a season. You are following divine instruction. But to go and lock your life down for five years. Oh, 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 oh. Later you now go and marry a lady who is doing well. And begin to scam her money. That the Holy Ghost told, told you that she should bring her money. <laughs> this is a serious matter. Don't take it for granted. That's why I'm taking my time to address every point. We have too many lazy believers. And that's why the people of the world are making, they are just going ahead. Going ahead. They understand how the systems work. Somebody has no job. He's too proud to teach. Me, I should go and teach in the secondary school. What do you have? Who is you? He has nothing to do with Tell him, go and sell clothes. He said, me? You can't sell, but you are begging. Which is more honorable? Oh, but how far? I, I beg, if you get 2,000 there, man, you know easy. And you can't sell clothes. You are a big man. And you are begging. You are coming to church. You want to lead prayer. You go and borrow suit. And then you are acting as if God is helping you. We are deceived in the church. I was telling some of the guys working with me. Brother Reward took over the TV project. And in three days, they walked around the clock. Everything was set. It's not part of those who came and said it's all about tongues. He has never missed a meeting. He attends all the prayer meetings. He's part of those praying online. But there is something about the mindset. They know the value of time. Come and find most of these brothers that only speak in tongues. Give them a walk. They will come back with excuses again and again and again. 
put them on the job, it will either fail or you fire them. And then when you hire those who can do it, they say, this person, he doesn't have a kindred spirit. How can you go and rent, hire somebody who is not a believer? Do you know the job? And every day we gather, we want to pray in tongues. Ooh, 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 and fall down. Now that you are falling down for five years, what has happened to you? And we think revival is all about shouting. If there is no economic boom, we will be raising the dead. Nobody will hear about it. Did you not read about our brothers in the world? He woke up on his birthday. He said, he needed, if you love me, send me one million. And in less than 24 hours, in less than 24 hours, million was not 10, it was not 20, it was not 30. And in about five days, he raised over 250 million. That's his cycle. You check, probably none of them is speaking in tongues. But if they want to bring something into Abuja, they can shut down the youths of Abuja. They can shut down this city. And half of your church members will go there to attend the party. They don't need to pray for 30 days for God to bring the souls. They will invade the whole space and shut down the city. And 70% of the people who will be in the show will be Christians. Because they know what to do. They know what to touch. We are lazing around. And it's pathetic. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 11 and 12. Paul said, And that ye study to be quiet and do your own business and to work with your own hands as we have commanded you. It's not an advice. As we have commanded you. He said, work with your own hands. Our own idea of grace is to exonerate us from every responsibility. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28, it says, let him that stole steal no more, but walk with his hands that he may have to give. He was talking to a thief. A thief in church after all. And he said, he said stop stealing. And then the thief will say, okay, he will think he will give him a job or give him money. He said, now that you have stopped stealing, go and walk. And he said, when you are done walking, get money and help the poor. What a commandment. You don't know this, you idle away. It's when you are 60 years old, you will weep. There's nothing wrong in praying or shutting down to pray. Especially if it's by divine instruction. God will use it to advance revival. But you will not be part of it. That's the, that's the repercussion. You've got to wake up and labor. Don't I do away. You can be praying in tongues on your job. You can be a medical doctor. You are going into the theater praying in tongues. Your job is not on your lips. You can be in the market selling clothes. You are selling, you are speaking in tongues. In fact, it's actually a sign that you are spiritually mature because you can carry your atmosphere everywhere. It's not only when you come to church and people are praying that you are in the spirit. While you are here driving, you are in the spirit. While you are in the market, you are in the spirit. And it gives you an... Did you not know about the sons of the bond woman? In fact, the reason they walk is to give them opportunity to enter every nook and cranny of the state. So most of the people you call shoe shiners, wheelbarrow pushers, water sellers, they are not. They are astrologers. But they need something that legitimizes they are walking into the neighborhood. So as they are shining shoes in people's compound, they are chanting incantation. So they can carry their atmosphere into their office. They can carry their atmosphere into their job. But you are the only person that thinks your own atmosphere is created when you are in church. They come to your neighborhood that they are doing shoe shining. They are selling water. It's a lie. When they enter your compound to shine your shoe, they drop incantation there. When they enter the streets, they drop incantation there. They know how the spirit realm works. We are religious people. We don't even have spiritual intelligence. Who told you the banking sector will be delivered if you are not there speaking in tongues? 
Who told you the medical world will be delivered if you are not there speaking in tongues? You are not just taking the job to survive. The job becomes a platform for expressing ministry. Because ministry is not only in the church. That's why today everybody who is on fire is either an apostle or a prophet. You can be an active politician and like Daniel, three times in a day you pray facing Jerusalem. The political corridor becomes a platform for exercising ministry. This is why Paul insists that everyone must work with his hand. Everyone. Number three, why must we work? There is reward for every labor. That means if you don't work, you can receive a gift. If you don't work, you can receive a token. But if you want to work in the corridor of reward, you must labor. Because reward is not a gift. Reward is the just recompense for services rendered. So those who work in the realm of rewards are those who are working. Many people can receive handouts. They can receive tokens. They can receive gifts. But if you want to be stable in life, you must find something doing. Because only by working can you be entitled to reward. Proverbs 14 verse 23. They say, in all labor, there is profit. They say, but the talk of the lips tended to penury. The reason we are talking and becoming poor is because we are not working. They say, but if you need profit or if you want to work in profit, then you must pay the price to labor. In all labor, there is profit. In Galatians 6 verse 9, it says, and let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That means those who reap are those who render services. That's why it's a waste of time to envy. You can go for a meeting with somebody and I've experienced it a lot of time. They put me and the preachers on the same poster. Sometimes I'm even more well post. And when we go for the poster, they carry the preacher and put in a presidential suit. And then they put me in one room and I'm saying, well, since you have dishonored me, don't expect so much to happen in this meeting. When I finish with my anger, the Holy Ghost will now tell me that you have not arrived there yet. So they are operating with you based on your level. If you want to be there, grow. Because you'll be angry and say, are we not all on the same poster? Are we not all preachers? Now you are expecting me to come and manifest. So it's not about manifestation. It's about growth. It's about capacity. Because some of these men will come and will not manifest. But that they came for the conference, the ministry will shift. The people who invited them know. So if you like, come and shout and run around the altar. Your honorarium will be one tenth of the other person who spoke in the very... Sometimes when they are speaking, they drink water. You are talking, the whole church is shaking. Everybody is jumping. When you finish jumping, when they are taking you to the hotel, they will take the man in convoy. They will take you in one hundred accord. If it pains you, grow up. Don't be high-minded. It's simple. That's how life works. You receive to the degree of your contribution. If you are not adding value, you cannot receive nothing. The value you add is what determines what you receive. That's why we work and why working, we are improving on a daily basis. I remember when I will go for a meeting, I will preach heaven down. Oh, Jesus. If I start preaching once in a week, you can't sit down. The energy I come into the meeting with. I, I See, I, I went for one meeting as I was preaching. People were running. Literal fire was on people. Meanwhile, in this meeting, they pleaded with me that the transport arrangement they had, something went wrong, that if I can get cab, I'm guest minister, I should get cab. I said, okay, let's believe their story. When I came, I preached fire. When I finished, they now walked me to another cab and said, thank you so much. They paid for the cab as a sign of honor. They now gave me an envelope. When I opened it, it was 3,000. The cab I picked to the meeting was 2,000 naira. To show you the distance. And they gave me 3,000. Jesus. What is the meaning of this? I got so mad. <laughs> and God will tell you, keep quiet. Sometimes when you are angry like that, a scripture will now pop up to remind you that if you say something, you may lock your future season. 
So you will just keep that anger because spirits are waiting for you to talk. They walk with your utterances. So a scripture will quickly advise you. Keep quiet. If you say something now, it may be the reason why you will not be promoted. I now heard my piece. I started growing. Few years later, I go for a meeting. I speak for one session. They give me two million. No shouting, no drama. I speak for evening, speak in the morning. They give me three million. And they are giving it with honor. With so much honor. I'm coming for a meeting. They book business class. I miss the flight. They charter a private jet. And say, pick him to come. I'm coming to talk sometimes for one hour, 30 minutes. What is the difference? You kept at what you are doing and you kept improving. As you are growing in it, the reward begins to grow. People sit down idle and they are telling God for the day he will open the door. That day will never come. It will never come. I'm telling you why we are not prospering. We master the wrong things. In Psalm 128 verse 2, he said, for thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands. He said, happy shall thou be, and it shall be well with thee. You will eat of the labor of thy hands. Prosperity does not begin and end with giving and receiving. You've got to work with your hands. Don't allow your destiny to be scammed. At old age, you will weep. In Proverbs 16 verse 3, he said, commit thy works unto the Lord. And thy thoughts shall be established. In Proverbs 21, 25, he said, The desire of the slothful killeth him. He said, For his hands refuse to labor. For the man that labors, he said, His thoughts shall be established. He said, But for the slothful, his desire will kill him because his hands refuse to labor. You want to walk in honorable and true prosperity. You must find something doing with your hands. That's the foundation of prosperity and prosperity with integrity. I told you from the beginning, for you to prosper, you must walk by mysteries and you must walk by instructions. If you violate these instructions, you will travel from coast to coast, receive all the impartation. You will be shocked what your life will become. Finally, for those who walk with their hands, God blesses the works of their hands. They don't just have rewards. God blesses them. In Deuteronomy 28 verse 12, he said, For the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasures, the heavens to give thee rain unto the land in this season, in his season. And he said, To bless all the works of thy hands, and thou shalt lend unto many nations and thou shalt not borrow. So as you walk with your hands, it says God will bless it and then you will become a blessing to many nations and you will not borrow. But the protocol of becoming big enough to bless many nations is that there is a work of your hands that God blesses. And so if there is no work you are doing, there is nothing God will bless. We have made Christianity mysticism and religious environment. People just come and shout for 10 minutes and they think their life will change and remain like that because of that 10 minutes. Brothers, there is a walk underneath. In Psalm 90 verse 17, it says, And let the beauty of our Lord be upon us and establish thou the works of our hands. It says, Yea, the works of our hands shall be established. That means the glory of God rests upon the works of your hands. So if you have no works, there is nothing God will rest upon. In Psalm 1 verse 3, the Bible said, And he shall be like the tree, that's the righteous, planted by the rivers of waters, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. He said, His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth, it shall prosper. Whatsoever he doeth, it shall prosper. And so if you are doing nothing, there is nothing that will prosper. When God wants to bless you, he looks out for the works of your hands. And so a man who walks with his hands is a man that is assured of the blessings of God. This is not just for Christians. He say, I curse my rain 
to fall on both the good and the evil. It's a natural law. That's why the people of the world are working hard and working smartly and they are making wealth in life. Making riches. Making money. You want to be part of those whose finances are established and who have dominion in the realm of finances. You must get something doing. I don't have time to talk to you how you do what you do. I would have talked about focus, about diligence, about consistency, about tenacity. I would have spoken about all of that. But it will take me too far from my script. Maybe at another time we'll look at it. But the first way to work in financial dominion is by working with your hands. Now, for those who work with their hands, there are six tests they must pass before the blessings of God rest upon it. Because all of us can be working and some may be cutting corners. There are six tests that everyone working with his hands must pass. The first test is the test of righteousness. God is not committed to evil. And so when you are walking, your heart must be with God. And the way it shows is that you walk with integrity. Because the moment you drift from integrity, it means you are beginning to pursue something else other than God. And in Matthew 6, 24, he said you cannot serve two masters. You can't serve God and serve mammon. You will obey one and disobey the other. So everyone who wants to prosper by walking must pass the test of integrity. If your integrity is questionable or if you begin to cut corners on that job, you will never find the work, the blessings of God. And that job will become a toil. And the Bible said the labor of the foolish wearies every one of them because they know not how to enter the city. One of the ways to enter the city is to walk with integrity. It may be slow. Just hold your peace and keep trusting God. It is God that brings promotion to men. Don't because you want increased pay, cut corners. Because if your allegiance and loyalty to God is cut off, that job has become your God. And the Bible said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and suffers the loss of his soul? You must pass the test of righteousness and integrity. The second test everyone working with his hand must pass is the test of humility. The Bible said in James chapter 4 verse 7 and 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8 it said God resists the proud but he giveth more grace to the humble. I know you are a CEO at the age of 23. Don't rub it off on your generation because your ego and your pride may just be the reason why not the devil but God will ebo you out of influence. He said God resists the proud but he giveth more grace to the humble. So why God is prospering you with what you are doing, be careful not to begin to make a statement that amplifies your pride. Be careful to remain under the mighty hand of God so that he will keep promoting you in your seasons. Many people fall not because they are not hardworking and diligent. They fell because the first glory God exposed them to. Their pride demoted them. And so as God is lifting you while you are walking, insist to stay humble. Men may want to applaud you. Sing your praise. Be careful. Be very careful. Because as men begin to applaud you and say many lofty things about you, a point will come, you'll begin to see yourself more than you ought to. And the Bible said, God speaking to Saul, he said, when you were small in your own eyes, he said, did I not make you king over Israel? The day Saul became big in his own eyes, that's the day God demoted him. You must be careful to sustain a posture of humility while God is lifting you up. The stabilizer for progressive rising is humility. When you see a man rising consistently, go and check that man. There is something humble about his spirit that God sees, that makes God insist that that man never misses his season. Praise the name of the Lord. Are you learning something? The body of Christ needs you to be wealthy. God needs you to be wealthy. The assignment of the kingdom of the last day 
is too heavy for only intercessors. Intercessors will die if they are the only ones carrying the body. So God needs sons of consolations as well. Why the intercessors are praying, these ones are pushing it with resources. So as we teach on prayer, violently and the atmosphere explodes, we need to open the eyes of people also to the, the precepts of God as touching for their prosperity. Praise the name of the Lord. The third test they must pass is the test of honor. You must be careful not to despise entities and authorities that are above you. We must be careful. In fact, you've got to make up your mind to consciously honor those who are ahead of you. The Bible said David behaved himself wisely before the king. Now, this was the king that wanted to kill him. David didn't stand up and say, me too. I'm ordained and anointed a king. What do you think you are? You will die. Men that will make impact in the world of finances have got to be careful because you don't know who will speak well of you in, see, in high corridors. You don't know who will just stand up for you and defend you. Some of the people that will defend you, they will not defend you because you spit fire. They will defend you because of the mark of honor that they saw in your spirit. That's what they will do. They will say, if it is this one, that cannot happen. We will rather die for him. And you may not even be aware those who fight for you. That's why you've got to be careful. There are many people who know so much. Make a mistake. Don't dot one eye in a 12-page letter. They will come and amplify that eye in order to discredit you. And they are doing it publicly. Have you seen all the young apostles online recently? When the message is going on, they will go and hang on the comment box like a gazelle. And then they carry their computer and enter Microsoft Word. And they will write a treatise for one sentence that was wrong. That's why their platform is comment box. God is using somebody to impact people in 30 nations. You sit with your computer, arm yourself with Microsoft Word, and you are typing. And you are waiting for everybody that will attack that notification. And the moment a, a notification pop up, he enters another three times. You know how to write so much. And we have not seen any of your books on Amazon. Arrogance. That's why people don't rise. Go and check our Igbo brothers that humble themselves to learn apprenticeship for seven years. Sometimes they hand over the whole business to them. In fact, sometimes in the sixth year when they should be settled, the Augusta looks in for something to discredit them. But they know the ropes. So no matter what the Augusta says, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, they want to take an inheritance. Sometimes in the seventh year, the Oga will now wake up and tell them to sleep in the rain. They are arrogant. They will lie down there. Nobody will hear. Because the man is looking for something to es escalate so that he will say, this boy, I've tolerated him for long. Get out of this place. It's a lie. I will insist through honor until I receive what belongs to me. This is what many people don't know. That's why they are expelled when it's about the time of their exhortation. You've got to insist to honor people. Do it until it becomes your lifestyle. Consciously and unconsciously, you are honoring people. And as you are doing it, God will raise an army to defend you in the day of trouble. People who excel, they know the code of honor. They are not ashamed about it. They do it publicly. If I see a senior minister, I kneel down, even if he's on the road, to be prayed for. Wherever it is, some people see you and say, pray for me, me. I tell them immediately, without every contradiction, the lesser is blessed of the better. I can kneel down anywhere to be prayed for. Because you thinking we are of the same stature does not increase me. But in honoring those who are ahead of you, you will just enjoy the goodwill of people. Things just begin to work for you. Many people don't know that they are the architects of their misfortune. They create warfares for themselves that are not necessary. You want to succeed in the corridor of hard work and diligence? you must honor those who are ahead of you. Don't stand up and say, nobody is God. <laughs> you will be in trouble. God called Joshua the servant of Moses. The Bible called Elisha, the man that poured water in the hand of Elijah. Is it that God is not aware about human worship that he said, Joshua is not my servant, he's Moses' servant. 
Can you correct God? Be careful so that you don't truncate the path that is meant for your prosperity. Most of the battles people are fighting today is because they dishonor people they shouldn't dishonor. And because they, were, they are wrong, God can't support them. That's why they are struggling. I know the place of people trying to victimize others. If you are actually innocent, God will fight for you. And the results will show. But make sure it's a point of duty for you to truly from your heart honor those who are ahead of you. Number four is the test of diligence. You can't succeed in anything that you are not diligent about. In Proverbs 22, 29, it says, Seest thou a man diligent in his business? It says he will stand before kings and not before men. men. Most of us have great ideas, great talents, great gifts, but we are haphazard about it. We never sit down, pay attention to details, and tenaciously follow through with the requirements of those gifts and those ideas until they come to pass. That's why we keep struggling. People see people who succeed and they just start talking nonsense. Say, God has helped this person. Who is God not helping? If God is not helping you, will you survive? God is helping all of us. The Bible says he's not a favorite of men. He is favorably disposed to everybody. Everybody is where they are today based on the diligence they've given to the assignment God has given to them. I was with Bishop David Oedeko's secretary when they came to Abuja. And we were talking, talked until the program was over. They left Abuja to the airport at about 9 o'clock. And I told him, ah, we can't talk today again since you will rest when you get back home. He looked at the time. He said, the day is still young. That's 9 o'clock. They landed Ota at 12 midnight and they went straight to work. And they walked till 2 a.m. And when they finished, the next day they must all be in church by 5 a.m. for early morning due. How do you close by 2 a.m. and resume work by 5 a.m.? You now say they, they, it's anointing. You don't know that the results you see are born out of diligence, doggedness, discipline, focus, and commitment. This is why the lazy fail. I can tell you that most of the men that became nothing in life are the most gifted men. Why rising up, they perched around word of knowledge, perched around healing, perched around prophecy. And they never paid attention to the diligent requirements of their call. They will never sit down to read the Bible. They will never take time to fast. They will never go out on evangelism. They wake up, have one or two invitations, and they feel because they prophesy, the word will come to them. You are joking. Up till last week, Bishop Oedeko went to the street for evangelism. That's why living faith is where it is. I heard him talking last year. He said his evangelism team, not the church, his own evangelism team won 8,400 souls. That's a general overseer who has been in ministry for more than 40 years. It's called diligence. The same way they went to the street 40 years ago, that's how they are still going to the street. The church is not big because the man is anointed. Yes, he's anointed. But there are rigors that go under the assignment that you don't know. And then you are a businessman. You stroll to shop around 10. All your customers came and left. You say, don't worry. I'm the only person that should sell spare part here. The next spare part seller will come next week. In fact, your laxity is what will open his eyes that this spare part business, there's a vacuum. And that's why most people can't stand competition. But in the business world, brother, there's a lot of competition. That's why you need a lot of diligence to man your own gate. Whether you are in ministry, whether you are in the academia, whether you are in the market, there's got to be diligence at the foundation of what you do. Those who live with me know, even if I lie on my bed, I can't sleep until it's past 2 a.m. The guys who work in the technical unit, sometimes in a day, I'm on five meetings. Sometimes the meeting I have here is the fourth meeting of the day. I finish talking to those in Zambia. I talk to those in Kenya. I talk to those in America because we are in different time zones. Sometimes I finish a meeting from here. I still have three other meetings. They are sleeping. Come on, wake up. Who told you what did I sleep by 12? <laughs> when I psych them like that, they will now wake up and start working. It's training. And sometimes we are streaming around 1 a.m. Because 1 a.m., is 6 p.m. in America or 7 p.m. in America. 
And if you need to disciple the leaders there, then you must stay awake. We are on a two weeks program now. The classes are for 3 a.m. in the morning. Pastor Sunday is running it. And he can't wake up and tell me he's tired. Because if you are tired, we will fail. And so it's better you gather your tiredness until you are 80 years old. That time you have the right to rest. You can't rest when you are 30 something. What is the meaning of that? <laughs> you don't know how people succeed. You think people are anointed. God, God have shown mercy on some people. I mentored a group of people for one year, six months. We were meeting every two, two days. I will travel. Sometimes I come back from my meeting tired. If you see my face, you think this guy wants to faint. I will still go and teach them on Zoom for one hour. And the power of God will be moving. And then when we show up, people are sowing seeds. People are coming to honor the grace. You look at it and say, man, God has helped some people. <laughs> Listen, there is a grace that will come upon you. See, fire is not just about praying. There's a fire that will come upon you in three months, you will do four courses. You will have so much energy. You will be attending some classes around 2 a.m. in the morning. Because you are in Harvard. My wife finished a senior manager's course with Harvard Business School. There are courses where by 2 a.m. in the morning sometimes. You can't miss class. They are checking whether you attended. As you watch the video, they are asking you questions. But you want to lead in your world, you've got to pay the price. That's why I said only the diligent stand before kings. Kings only come to the brightness of your rising. But it will take diligence to become bright. You are a video editor. And you have not sat on YouTube to watch at least 100 videos about editing. Every day you edit. You write name. The name is shaking like this on the video. <laughs> you say you are a tailor. You need to go and buy an Italian suit. You will lose the suit. Cut according to how it was cut. And sew it. Until you master how to sew Italian suit. People will no, need, no longer struggle to import. They will look for you. Who told you things happen by chance? No impartation can impart that. It takes diligent commitment. That's why what we call prosperity many times is calm. <laughs> You must pass the test of diligence. Number five, you must pass the test of wisdom. What distinguishes a man is the quality of wisdom he has. Many businessmen, especially in the early days of their work, very early in the morning, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., they wake up and they sit alone. They are searching for inspiration. Because they know they will not prosper just because today they are the biggest in the market. There are many businessmen, they fly out of their country. They go to another country and they sit on the beach. Not because they came to say, hey, I've come to Bahamas. They are walking on the white sand and as the ocean is passing, it's helping them to think. They are searching for wisdom because wisdom is a defense. The man who has wisdom is the leader. It's not the biggest man. You can finish gymming for two years and you become the bodyguard of the wise man. Because it's not the size of the muscle that confers leadership. It's the size of the mind. And so the Bible says to buy the truth and sell it not. That thing you are doing, you need a thousand and one inspiration that somebody else does not have. That's what sets you apart in that corridor. And so you will pay the price to seek. He said, whoever lacketh wisdom, she will ask of him that giveth liberally and unbraided not. So there are many times when for two weeks you need to sit down and ask God, Lord, what wisdom do I need in this internet business? I'm a blogger. How come all my videos are just 2K views? How do I make it 100K view? And you are praying for two weeks to know how your videos can grow from 2K view to 100K. That's a very spiritual prayer. Because your job is blogging. You may be praying, and while you are praying, your question is, how do I expand this pepper business? I've been here for 10 years. I can't remain like this. 
you have encompassed one mountain for too long. When light breaks out, you will break forth. You are a graphic designer. The graphic design you did last week is almost identical with the one you did in 2012. And you say, oh man, we are moving. We are moving. You are not moving. And if you are actually moving, then you are going backward. <laughs> You've got to grow in wisdom. And many times to grow in wisdom, it takes prizes. Sometimes you stay alone for weeks in order to tap into inspiration. Sometimes you need to travel somewhere and hear somebody who has gone ahead of you in that field so that you can tap into something. It's the same song you are singing that somebody else is singing in Wembley Stadium. Throughout last week, I sat with Bishop David Oedeko. What are the secrets of church growth? I want to make more impact. What are you doing? Where you are is a forest. People are paying terrible prices to come and sit down there. There's something you know. And I'm not listening to the message because I want to preach it. I want to enter into what he knows. You are a leader. You are a politician. And you can't deliver a speech for 15 minutes. They wake you up every day. You are, you, you are reading. Uh, uh, okay, um, uh, yes, um, sorry. I beg your pardon. Uh, uh, sorry, one minute, two minutes. You are trying to read for five minutes. I beg your pardon. Appear ten times in a five-minute speech. Because even the letter, you, could, you didn't write it. I saw one on Channels TV. M, M, M. M, M, M became a trend. Because of the kind of politicians we have in Nigeria. How come you have not registered under the mentorship program of Plo Lumumba? The wisest people in, in, in Africa. And hear them talk to open your mind. Not in government, but he can analyze the problem of every African country. And when he's talking... It's like a song. It's singing into your ears. How come you've not sat under such men to buy the wisdom they have? And you think you will wake up and become successful. That's why our own idea of leadership is, 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 to, is to cut corners. Because we don't have what it takes. Somebody is a president of a country. He doesn't know the problem of that country. You want to address your own country. You want to address your own state. On live television, you are reading on paper. What is the hope of the state? I was listening to Nana Kufo, the president of Ghana, addressing United Nations. I said, this is a president. I don't need to be a Ghanaian. I was impressed. When he was talking, he could match any, any president from any nation. While the Kenyan crisis was happening, I saw the delegation, the Ukrainian crisis, the delegation from Kenya, when the guy spoke, the speech of two minutes went viral. The wisdom he communicated, even the UN, the people needed to check dictionaries to, to follow him. You are not backward because you are in Africa. You are backward because you have not bought enough wisdom. You can command the attention of the world from Africa. Did you not hear about Nelson Mandela? How, can, how come you are a leader? And you don't have five mentors. Man, 10 years ago, I can, I can speak the tongues of Bishop Oedipo. I'm not saying speak in tongues like him. I chewed, I chewed the man until I can speak the same tongues that he spoke in messages. I can score his messages. If he start preaching anyone, I will be saying what he will say next. Because the area where you are going, you will follow the people. God told me I will start crusade now. Every crusade, Dr. Paul goes to him. I'm finding out what is going on here. What is happening here? You've got to buy wisdom to be ahead in life. And whichever field God has called you to, you've got to have trailblazers that inspire you. And as they are inspiring you, they are opening you, opening you up to wisdom. And a point will come, you will now begin to pray and ask God for light to take you ahead. We are in an era where messages are free. That's why people took messages for granted. I used to buy Pastor Chris's messages with my pocket money as a student. As an LYC student, I got messages over 300 with money. God has opened up a new era now. You scroll on Facebook, there are messages and people can't hear. 
if you bought one CD plate for 700 naira, even you know that every sentence in that message, you must know it. <laughs> if I was into car business, by now I would have, I would have met Cosmos Maduka. It's not even prayer point. We would have sat down and talked. I will pursue you doggedly. You can't avoid me. Because I must carry, I must catch what you have before you live here. Who told you we will permit you to go to the grave with that wealth? We will take every bit of it by hearing what you say, learning your secrets and receiving impartation from you. It's not only prophets and apostles that impart people. If you are a businessman, better look for godly businessmen. Let them lay hands on you. The spirit they carry will be transferred. Listen to them. Sit on them. Don't only hear an apostle whose emphasis is ministry. God has sent you to business. If you hear that this man is in any business seminar, go and download the message. Some of you, your playlists have to change. Because you are a businessman, you need to find out the Christian businessmen. Hear everything they have said. Find out their secret and connect to what they have. You've got to buy wisdom. Too many people lack wisdom. That's why we don't make progress. You want to prosper? Wisdom must become a weapon that you wield at will. And the last test you must pass is the test of priesthood. Wherever you are walking, you must have a mobile altar. Priesthood is not for prophets, evangelists, and apostles. Priesthood is for every believer. God said, I have made you a nation of kings and priests. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 6, it says he washed us in his blood and made us kings and priests. All of us are priests. And so you can be a lawyer, you can be a marketer, you can be a blogger. Whatever it is you are, if you want to succeed, ensure that your altar is alive. Why? Because this test will ensure your preservation. Because you can be prospering and your altar is weak. You will be cut off overnight. That's why many people at the prime of their career, that's when they are cut off. They got everything right except priesthood. And the day God wants to exhort them, that's the day they are cut off. I met a young man six years ago. A very clean footballer. Powerful midfielder. They had concluded about his signing everything. The night he was supposed to travel, he slept the night before. And somebody came in the dream, held his hand, and pulled this bone out. His hand became like this. Ah! And this is not fairy tale. Somebody held his hand, pulled the hand out of joint. Till today, they've not been able to fix that hand. If you see him, his bone, the bone is like this. And he cannot run at all. He can't even try it. And a career that would have been an outstanding career shut down. Because every other thing was kept. Priesthood was lacking. That's why whatever it is you do, you must learn to pray for yourself. If you don't pray for yourself, some of the intercessors that will call you around 2 a.m. and say we are praying for you is a lie. If I'm praying for you, how will I be sending messages at the same time? The moment he sent that text, he slept. Hoping that by coincidence, that thing will happen. And when it happens and you come, you say, that time I sent you that message, I was on a mountain. My sisters used to have one intercessor. Around 1 a.m., he will send message. He will say he sent this message from the mountain. I told them, this man is a scam. If you have bodies to climb the mountain, you will leave your phone at home. Who carries his phone to the mountain? And around 2 a.m., he's sending messages. He went there for holiday. It's not intercession. <laughs> Thank God for people praying for you. Bro, your knee must hit the ground. You are the first prophet over your life. And if you don't pray for yourself, anything that happens to you, bear it. Because your laxity on the altar, you must recompense from it by the surprises of life. That's why we are happy for all who pray for us. Those who are burdens to pray for us. But every one of us pray our way through life. 
Because a day will come when everybody will have legitimate needs to pay attention to. And when that day come, make sure you don't become porous because your intercessors got busy. If people are praying for you, it's an added advantage. You must be the first priest over your life. Every prophetic word that comes to you should be a confirmation of what God told you. Because you too are contending for your destiny. Don't leave your destiny in the hands of another person. If you have the Holy Spirit, you can pray. And even if you don't know what to pray for, as you ought to, the Bible already captured it. Pray until you grow. You want to prosper? You must walk with your hands and then you must pass this six test. If you do, nothing on earth can make you poor. Nothing on earth can bring you down. If you have somebody praying and imparting you, that's an advantage. But beyond that impartation, you will excel. That's why some of the wealthiest men in the world are godless. Because there's a residual grace already in nature to prosper you. All you need to do is to align through walking with your hand and cooperating with some of these tests that God puts in nature to create balance in the operations of nature. Ah. The second thing we do to prosper is the covenant. This is where the spiritual angle comes in. But we don't have time. You know, when I was coming for this meeting, I prayed. I said that these people will not hear another message. That these words will enter their spirit and empower them. And let the proof of this service be revealed in one month, in three months, in six months. That as they walk with these things, their lives will literally have a turnaround. And there will be testimonies to prove that what they heard were true. And everyone under my voice this evening, because you have heard these words, you can never be poor in your life. The power of God that exalts will mantle you and shift you from where you are to where you ought to be. It doesn't matter the causes or the patterns in your family. I come as a priest in the order of Melchizedek and I decree concerning you every force that have kept you down before now in the name of Jesus they give way for your prosperity please sit down you don't have to be 50 years old to be a millionaire some of you will step into wealth and into fortune at very tender age when we come to church and we see 23 year old ladies that have 40 million in their accounts. There's too much to do. The church cannot afford to be poor. And the church is not a building. The church is not just a general overseer. The church is every one of us numbered in the family of God. And I speak to your destiny today. The hand that lifts, the power that establishes, the grace that exalts, in the name of Jesus the Christ, step into that grace now. Please sit down. Can we borrow another 15 to 20 minutes? Let me talk briefly about the covenant. Some of you, before this service is over tonight, there's an anointing that will come on you. It will, it will be a literal scepter. You will know you have caught it. And as you live here, your story will be turned around. I'm not telling you stories. Listen. At least since we came here, there have been some testimonies. I spoke over a man. He went and sold seven buildings in four days. There's a brother of mine. I think I will arrange for his testimony next week. When he came to see me, the car that he was driving broke down on the road. He entered the car. Three months later, as I'm talking to you, he has a, 20, 
a 2020 Honda. He has a terrible Mercedes Benz. And he has bought his own duplex. I'm not saying renting. He bought. Somebody that three months before, his car was breaking him down on the road. There's an anointing that lifts. That anointing with somebody tonight. The second way to prosper in this kingdom is by the covenant. Before you appreciate the covenant, you need to understand the character of God as touching covenants. There is a character disposition that God has towards covenant. For example, his covenant with David in Psalm 89 verse 34. He said, my covenant will I not break, neither will I alter the things which is gone forth out of my mouth. So God deliberately keeps covenant. He endorses covenants by an oath of his integrity. In Isaiah 33 verse 20 and 25, he said, except my covenant be not with the sun and the moon, will I break my covenant with my servant David. That means so long as God and covenant is concerned, his reputation is on the line. In Hebrews chapter 6, from verse 17, the Bible speaking concerning God and the new covenant. He said, because there was none greater than him that he should swear by. He said he swore by himself. And he said, by two immutable things by which God cannot lie, we have a consolation. So when we talk about the covenant, we are talking about something that beckons on the totality of God's integrity. In fact, God seals it by an oath. That was the covenant he had with Abraham. He swore by himself. He didn't need to, but just to let you know the depth of the committer of his integrity. And so every time we are talking around the corridor of covenant, it's something you can bank your life on. The covenant is not a joke. It's a summation of the integrity of God in motion. So God has a covenant of prosperity with his people. And you know when that covenant was activated? In Genesis chapter 8, from verse 20 to 22, when the world was destroyed, there was a need to recreate the world. And this time, God is not coming back. The first time the world was destroyed, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, God came back and recreated the world in six days. For the second time, the world is now destroyed by a flood. And God will not come back this time. So there's not going to be let there be light. This time, man will recreate the world. And so in order for man to be equipped and fortified enough to recreate the world, God had to activate a covenant. And the covenant he had with Noah is the covenant of exemption. That you will no longer be destroyed. And while you are yet being exempted, I will prosper you. And so he gave him a code for activating that covenant. He said, seed time and harvest. Cold and heat. Summer and winter will not cease. That means so long as the climatic condition are kept, if you want to prosper, keep sowing. You are permitted to stop sowing if climate ceases to exist. But so long as you look and sun and moon appear, cold and winter appear, he said if you can see climate in motion, that means if you sow, you must reap. So the covenant of prosperity anchors on sowing. And so Jesus came to corroborate that fact. In Luke chapter 6 verse 38, he said, Give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over. Shall God cause men to give to your bosom? That means the power of God that manipulates nature in your advantage can never be activated except as you activate it with your giving. Because God has already blessed you. But there is a dimension of blessing. 
that causes men to support you. There's a dimension of blessings that causes nature to work in your favor. He you said, for that layer to be activated, you've got to give. Because God will only cause men to give to you the measure you have given and beyond. If only you can give. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, he said, him that soweth sparingly, he said, he shall reap sparingly. He said, but him that soweth bountifully, he shall reap bountifully. Why? He said, God loveth a cheerful giver. Many people don't know how to activate the covenant of wealth. And so when you talk to them about giving, they take a defense. They think you want to take from them. That's why I told you, for you to prosper in this kingdom, it's got to be by instructions and by mysteries. Because in the world out there, there is no promise of return for your giving. But in this world, the Bible says when you give, evil nature is commanded to begin to support you. In fact, the Bible said, the Libra soul shall be made fat. He said, him that watereth shall by himself be watered unto. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 2, he said, to give a portion to seven, he said, give a portion to eight, for you know not the evil that will come upon the earth. What is the Bible saying? That means the kind of prosperity the children of God walks in is not only regulated by nature. Now, hard work is regulated by nature and the systems of this world. But when you, to, you zoom into covenant, you have gone beyond the nature of this world, the, the systems of this world. Because he said, you know not the evil that will come upon the earth. That means, even if a plague befalls the earth, you will still prosper. I met a man who was given an award in Asaba, Pastor Kosfini Udoka, for building the fastest modern structure in Asaba. He built it in 10 months during COVID. Why the world was shutting down, there are people that were prospering because you know not the evil that will come upon the earth. So there is a spiritual strategy that when engaged, causes you to prosper even if the foundation of the earth were to be taken out of course. That code is the giving code. That's why in verse 5 of the same scripture, Ecclesiastes 11, he said, in the morning, give thy seed. He said, in the evening, withhold not thy hand, for you know not which of them will prosper. So the way a believer makes himself financially invincible is by giving. But here is the poor man in church, hoping that every day they will dash him something. The Bible said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Because the man who is receiving is taking the posture of a servant. The man who is giving is taking the posture of a king. And there are many returns that comes to him. Because the Bible said, the, the borrower is servant of the giver, of the lender. If all you do is to receive, not too long, your thinking process will be reconstructed to think like a poor man. You may think it's wisdom at the beginning. But after many years of your life, you will begin to look like a beggar. Because the power that makes men have dominion in the financial corridor is tied to your giving. This is why we teach the body how to give vehemently. Even though the world fights it. We are not in the world system. I would have been happy if God didn't mandate us to give and to give like crazy men. Everybody wants to keep his resources. But the kingdom where we are, the principle of return is designed in a way that only givers are permitted to have. That's why even God, when he wants to bless you, in Isaiah chapter 11, chapter 55 verse 11, he said he giveth bread to the eater and seed to the sower. He giveth seed because God knows that the only way your prosperity will be established is when you develop the capacity there are three ways to give in this kingdom and to give safely. I always tell people, ensure not to be coerced into giving because there's no reward into emotional giving for emotional giving. There are three ways to give in this kingdom. Number one is to give by revelation. That means you have understood from scripture 
what giving does. You know, when you give, God causes men to give to you. So without being coerced, you are looking for where there is a fertile ground so that you can plug your seed into. Because for you who have revelation, give is, giving is not giving away your resource. Giving is actually the, the enterprise of farming. You are sowing a seed that must produce a harvest. When a farmer goes to the field to plant, he's not thinking he has lost something. He knows that in due season, that one seed that entered the ground will become a tree. So you don't need to coerce him. He has a revelation of how the system works. So the moment there is rain, he goes out to, to throw his seed. He litters seeds everywhere. And you are wondering, these two bags of rice you are throwing away, can't you keep it and eat? The man knows, if I throw these two bags of rice away, I will have a hundred bags of rice later. He's functioning by an understanding. That's what you must have to be able to give and receive in this kingdom. You know by revelation. So when you give by revelation, you are not waiting for somebody to say thank you. You are not waiting for somebody to clap hands for you. When you give, you know you have planted a seed. And then you go back. When you are praying, your prayer now becomes a way of watering your seed. As you are prophesying, you are watering your seed. Because when the heaven be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. So men who are wise, when you see them decreeing, that we will rule this world. Everything we do prosper. They have a seed that is under the soil. They are talking based on what they have planted. But the foolish man have not planted anything. And he's talking empty words. And after five years, when you see two of them, the one who have a seed under the soil, we have something to harvest. So the first way to give in this kingdom is by revelation. When you know, even if you have 1,000 naira. You will not spend all yourself. You will try to give at least a portion. Every money that comes to your hand, you will invest a part of it. Because the Bible said, you don't know the one that produces result. People don't know giving. That's why they keep hiding money. They keep spending money on themselves. They think they are making progress. No. No. When revelation hits you, you will understand. That the way to preserve your future is to sow into your future. When you sow into your future, no power on earth can stop you. As a university student, I'm giving money to virtually every state of this country. They cannot afford, they cannot but open unto me. When I travel to a state, I'm not coming there for the first time. My money came 10 years ago. And the ground is ripe for my appearance. And so when I come, the people honor me. They don't know why. When I'm leaving, they gather their resources. It's a harvest. I'm not coming there for the first time. My monies have gone to India. It has gone to Pakistan. It has gone to many nations of the world. When I'm going there, I'm going there to harvest. I may not be going there focusing on money, but the resources of that land cannot but gravitate in my direction. I've sold into the land. The second way to give is by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so sometimes you sit down and the Holy Ghost say, give this, give that. When you hear that, I beg you, never turn it down. Because many times when the Holy Ghost leads you like that, there is something particularly he wants to deal with. But he wants your faith to be released. Because your faith will become the legality that he has in order to do that which he wants to do. That's why many times the Holy Ghost leads people to give. And when I'm teaching this subject, I advise people, don't touch monies meant for legitimate purposes except you are led. Because there are many people who hear about giving and in that state of emotion, they carry their school fees and go and give. That's not faith. That's emotion. You should only touch your school fees or touch your house rent, or touch money that is allocated for something when you are led. When you do that, your faith will be intact. You will not be under pressure. And you will grow steadily in giving. The third way to give is when giving becomes your lifestyle. So this time around, you cannot but give. You have trained yourself to operate like that. You have trained yourself. And it's natural for you to just give. That's the type the Bible calls the Libra soul. 
and the verdict of the Libra soul has already been passed. He said, the Libra soul shall be made fat. My friends that live with me know, no day passes without me giving. I've learned it for too long. I've done it for decades. If you live around me, you will know it's risky. I invest. I save. But I give like a madman. This thing of you empty your account, you are crying. We have passed that level since. I've emptied my account too many times. It's a natural thing. It's a natural thing. I can give my all today. Next tomorrow, something comes. I give all. Next week, I give all. I give all, all the time. In certain seasons, it has become natural because the Libra soul shall be made fat. When you give by revelation and give by leading of the Holy Spirit, a point come, giving becomes your lifestyle. If you are able to grow to a point where giving is your lifestyle, brother, welcome to the realm of millions. I know how it works. You cannot but operate there. Because that's how God judges men. He judges men based on percentages. He sees, it's not about how much you give. Two people can be in a meeting. One person has 10 million. He gives 300,000. Another person has 1,000 and gives 1,000. The man who gave 1,000 gave more. Because God doesn't need money. It's your heart he's looking for. And I'm going to teach you about the higher purposes of giving. When next I touch the subject. But you've got to give until it becomes your lifestyle. Stingy men don't go far. They are too small. Even God can't commit anything to them. They think only themselves and their families. And when you think yourself and your family, God will reduce the scope of your vision to you and your family. Your son will be an aeronautic engineer. Your daughter will be a doctor. Your, your son will be an accountant. Glory to God. You will stop there. But when God finds a Libra soul, he's looking for who can touch Canada, who can touch America, who can touch Uganda, who can touch Congo. You have developed enough capacity because you have shown that everything you have is not yours. You're only a steward. And because God knows that you are a steward, he begins to commit more to you. These things are learned. The Bible says, strong meat belongs to them. Hebrews 5.14, who by reason of use, exercise their senses to discern good and evil. They are learned. The first time God started teaching me how to give, he started me with 10 naira. And sometimes, I will have 100 naira, God will tell me to give 10 naira. This 10 naira will be a body. Because those days, I was an activist of Mikos. There's a suite called Mikos. I will keep, I keep them in bulk. You will never find me without Mikos. And I'm wondering if I give this 10 naira, this can buy me at least 8 Mikos. Why would I? It was a body. And God trained me like that until God started training me with 100 naira. Give 100 naira for offering. I say 100 naira for offering. I was a Catholic. And we are used to squeezing 5 naira and putting in the offering box. When they are counting offerings, 10 naira, big men give 20 naira. Even elders in church give 20 naira. How can you tell me to give 100? 100 naira. Because we didn't know we should give money in church. What do you? 100 naira. Why? I will give 100 naira when they are doing bazaar. How can I be giving 100 naira on ordinary service? Ah! Oh! God troubled me. I've shared the story before. So when I have money in my pocket and it's time for church, I will pull that cloth and hang it somewhere and wear another cloth so that me and God will know I didn't give because I didn't come to church with money. He kept at it. He kept at it. He kept at it. And when I give this 100 naira, I must tell the whole world. God is dealing with us. Can you imagine? I'm giving 100 naira. The people now say, wow. wow. I didn't know I was receiving my reward. God now told me, I didn't tell you to announce it. I started giving 100 naira. Sometimes the 100 naira will be my last card. As I started growing in it, a point will come, I will give 100 naira. And somebody will just dash me 200. Uh -uh. I now enter business with God. If I give this one with another one come, I will now enter a season of drought. I will give and nothing will come. God was training me. When I went for NYSC, they paid me 19.8. NCCF people came and said, you know, uh, it's good to serve the Lord with your money. 
<laughs> My brother, I know those scriptures you are quoting. Just go home. <laughs> they even did a formula for us. How you can give in one month or give in, in, in three months or give in six months or give in 12 months. When they gave us the card, as I was going out, I threw it away. I went to the room immediately and God said, give your first fruit. Ah, I was in Kanu. We are hearing of Boko Haram. You will lie down, you will hear, boom. They will say, that's a bomb. I, the first money that I entered, I should give it. I won't try that. I went to church in the morning. And the pastor that came flew in from Abuja. His name is Pastor Ego. He's the Christ Embassy Pastor of Sabongeri. And when he gave offering, I didn't know how he turned. I looked and his offering was 100,000. Hundred thousand. I say, how many services do they have here? They say it's two services in a week, and for both services, he flies in and out of Kano. He flies in twice every week. That was what helped my faith, and now gave my money. When I gave it, I was on my way home. Somebody called me from Benue, and said, my sister called me that somebody came home and sent thirty thousand naira to me. What? I came alive. <laughs> 30,000. The next time I went for finance convention, I didn't drop the whole money. I put my shoe, dropped it, dropped my watch. I trekked home barefooted. I started, see, it became madness. I gave all my NYC Alawi. People were saving their NYC Alawi that if they graduate, they may have something to do. That's very good. But some of us were madmen. And so I gave all. But today, <laughs> there's no day that I don't receive at least four alerts. It's not possible. I just came back from Asaba with my friend and I gave them $10,000. I said, deposit it. That's not monthly seed. That one is just, I came from a meeting. But it started with what? 10 naira. Now I can give $10,000. I don't even care about it. Because when you, it becomes a lifestyle, God raises you. And then a day will come when every day you are giving five, ten people. And you are wondering where the money is coming from. He said, as the wind blow it. Thou listest not from whence it cometh or where it goeth. He says, so are they that are born by the Spirit of God. There's an invincible finger that will be activated in your life. But is waiting for your faith level. So when God is training you to give, it's not about the money. He's helping you enlarge your heart to be able to receive. Because if you don't give one million, you may never be able to receive one million. If you don't give five million, you will never be able to receive five million. People actually receive at the level of their giving. And so God is trying to bring you higher. And so he's expanding you. He's expanding you. Sometimes for three months, every money that comes to your hand, they say give it. Give it, give it. And you are you will now ask yourself, wait, what is wrong? But you have known the voice of God, so you can't deny. And the day comes when you become the symbol of prosperity. Somebody will rise here so mighty. <laughs> you know, some of you have eaten your seed. God gave you seed to sow. You say, No, ah, I need to buy land now. The land you bought since 2001, you have not developed it. Because the money was not meant for land. Is it good to invest? Yes. But when the Holy Ghost speaks to you, He is taking you ahead in life. Don't eat the seed meant to purchase your future. This is a mystery and it's a spiritual law. The reason people remain small is that they keep and eat what they should invest in the spirit for their glory. Somebody will rise here that God will so lift up. That money will become a servant to you. If the church will be powerful, men must be taught these truths. Today, people come to church or go out, they are looking for where they will receive. When we were raised, we were taught to look for where to give. That's why they can't explain your life. Because everywhere you give to, you plug into that inheritance. And suddenly, your life becomes a mystery. You want to have dominion in finances, you must become a, a natural giver. 
You will be so drunk with this thing. Before I close quickly, five types of giving that you must indulge yourself in. Number one, we call them honor givings. Honor. That means you are giving it because you want to honor the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9, it says, honor the Lord with your substance. When you bend before God, it's called respect. When you give your substance to God, it's called honor. He said, honor the Lord with your substance. That's why God himself said, when you go to give to your governor, will you give him a blind sheep? Because your substance is a token of honor. And that's why what you are giving to God, even if it's 20 naira, don't squeeze it. Put it in an envelope. Give it honorably. That's all you have. It's not about how much. It's a hard posture. He said to honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruit of your increase. So these kinds of givings are called honor givings. And number one in this category is offerings. Many are not aware that there are three ways we make appearance before God. We make appearance before God through worship. We make appearance before God through prayers. And we make appearance before God through giving. In Acts chapter 10, from verse 1 to 4, speaking about Cornelius, he said, Thy prayers and thy alms giving have risen up to heaven as a memorial. That's why the Bible said, You shall not appear before the Lord empty. So every time you come before the Lord, your offering is your testimony of honor in that service. Not just what you say, but what you give. You don't go to a king without a gift. Even in the natural, men are aware. You honor the Lord with your substance. That's what your offering is meant for. That's why we call it worship offering. I don't have time to press deep into that. Number two, your tithes. 10% of all your finances. Titan is not a law thing. It didn't begin with the law. You need to know the difference between the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. The New Testament and the New Covenant. Not everything in the Old Testament is part of the Old Covenant. And I don't have time to explain that. Maybe I'll do a teaching on Titan to show you where to tithe, what to tithe, and how to tithe. But Titan, which is 10%, of what you have is given to God as a token of honor. In Genesis chapter 14 verse 20 when Melchizedek appeared to Abraham the Bible said Abraham gave him a tithe of all. There was no law there. It's a mystery in the kingdom that when you tithe number one you are exempted from the calamities of your, to, your society. That's why Abraham came out of that battle invincible. So he gave a tithe of all his company. It was never about the law. It was a token of God, of honor to the God of heaven. Number two is in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 2 and 5. They reiterated the tithe of Abraham. And the Bible went further in verse 5 to tell us that Levi that took tithe from Israel in the law, who didn't give tithe? He said, God reckoned that he gave tithe when he was in the loins of Abraham. That means even the priest tithe. If you don't tithe, things can happen to you. It's not about the law. It's a mystery in the kingdom. That's why wise men like Abraham began to engage it. Because when you honor God, his jealousy is invested upon you. In 1 Samuel 2.30, he said, him that honor me will I honor. He said, him that despises me shall be lightly esteemed. The third type of giving is first fruit. First fruit is a presentation of your first increase. So the first time you receive a particular kind of blessing or when you are promoted, 
the first of that increase that you, you receive. If God is your God, the Bible says to present it to God. In the case of tithe, when you give tithe, the Bible said if you give the tenth percent, it said the whole dough is holy. That means you are consecrated unto God. It becomes God's responsibility to preserve you. In the case of first fruit, when you give your first fruit, he say your bands will burst forth. That means the secret of geometric, unexplainable increase is tied to first fruit. The first time you got your salary, the first time you harvested a particular kind of crop, you carry a portion of it, or depending on your level of faith, you carry all of it and present to the Lord as an honor because you recognize that he is the one who has increased you. So when you give a 10%, every other thing is consecrated. God becomes your defender. The jealousy of God is invested upon you for your defense. Or when you give a first fruit, he said you will burst forth on every side. Have you seen people who keep increasing and keep increasing on ending and it looks as if God is biased towards them? They know this mystery. Every first business they start, they take it to God. It may look juicy, but they know how to expand. So they don't touch that part. They consecrate it to God as a token of honor. But find the first man. He receives his first salary. He will sit down at night and do a timetable. And he remains at that level, never increasing. It's a mystery and it's an instruction of the kingdom. That every promotion you have, the first increase you have belongs to God. That's why when God came to save Israel, he said the firstborn is mine. Every first thing you have, the jealousy of God is for it. He wants to take it as a sign that is your Lord. And that's what first fruit comes to do for us. But well, I can assure you that many Christians don't give first fruit. That's why people can explain all your money. But there is a mystery you tap into that you could be selling water. You are a billionaire. And they say, no, it can't be water. It's water with mystery. But many don't take advantage of mysteries. They are blinded. Oh my God, they are blinded. They are blinded. Praise the Lord. The fourth type of giving is what we call the ingathering. The ingathering is your last harvest at the end of your year or your cycle. That's what we actually call end of year thanksgiving in generic terms. But every time you complete a cycle in any enterprise, you are supposed to take an offering and present to the Lord. This is not a law. This is a testimony of honor that you started with God and you finished with God. In Exodus 23 verse 16, it says, And the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labor, gathered in thy labors out of the field, you gather your resources and you take a portion and present to God as a sign of honor. This is how our life is governed by mysteries. These things help you release your faith for more. Because if you don't do them, you will have unnecessary warfare to fight. When you have wisdom, you reduce your battles. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And the last kind of offerings are special offerings. When you want to give a thanksgiving for a special thing God has done for you, you bring a token before the Lord. These are the five types of givings that we are mandated to give. Now, as I round up, where and where is a believer supposed to give? Number one, he is supposed to give to the altar of God where he is nurtured. If God nurtures you from an altar, from a place, it's your spiritual responsibility to give to that altar. Paul said, we have served you with spiritual things. He said, you are supposed to serve us with carnal things. He said, bring the tithes and the first fruit to the house of God so that there will be meat in his house. Meat is not necessarily food to eat. It means the things done in the house of God are done with the resources of the people of God. So they bring their resources into God's kingdom so that the assignment of God's kingdom is carried out. Because if it doesn't happen, where will it come from? 
So God blesses his people so that his people can sponsor his assignment. It's an act of service and reasonable worship. Where is the second place to give? You give to the poor. The Bible said, Him that giveth to the poor lended unto the Lord. That means when a man gives to the poor, God becomes his debtor. There is a place where God blesses you because he's your father. There is a place where God blesses you because he's your creditor. He said, when you give to the poor, you make God your creditor. You lend to the Lord. And as you lend to the Lord, God will always pay. He said, him that looketh on the poor with pity shall not lack. So you don't only give to church. Most of the prosperity gospel now encourages people to only give to pastor and to church. It's not true. There is a blessing that comes from the altar. And there is another blessing that come because you gave to the poor. The reason is because the poor pray to God. And God will not jump from heaven to answer them. So when God uses you to answer their prayers, you become an answered prayer in your word. And so God is indebted to constantly increase you so you keep answering his prayers. What are the third category of people or places to give to? Orphans and widows. I don't have time to open scriptures anymore so that I don't continue talking. It's our duty once and again to seek out orphans and widows and give to them. Because orphans and widows are the lost portion. Let no year pass that you didn't take out time at least once to visit the orphanage or to visit orphans and give something to them. God is the husband of the widow and the father of the orphan. And so when you pay or give to these people on behalf of God, you have taken God's responsibility and the jealousy of God is invested for you to prosper. So you give to church or the house of God you give to the poor, you give to orphans and widows, and finally, you give for goodwill and societal development. Every believer should be functionally involved in giving to the development of his society. There is a blessing that comes with it. When you begin to give to us the things happening in your society, you are empowered. It's not only politicians that should buy cars and give to the police. But we are not taught. Sometimes you come and you give to civil society and support what they are doing. They may be corrupt, but that's your civil responsibility. When you begin to do these things, the jealousy of God is invested to prosper you. When you are operating like this, it is impossible for you to be poor. It is impossible. You will always prosper. So the second thing that makes for prosperity is the covenant. The last thing shall put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. And verse 24, it says you shall lay up gold as dust. Many people quote you shall lay up gold as dust and the gold of offer as the stones of the brook. It's a lie. You will only lay up gold as dust if you turn to him, put his word in your heart and put iniquity far from thy tabernacle. When you do this, he say you will lay up gold as dust. Three ways to prosper in this kingdom is to walk with your hands, engage the covenant and to live away from iniquity completely submitted to God. Bow your heads and pray. So river flow, river flow. Let it an river flow. In your church once again. Let it an be seen.
It doesn't cost God anything to prosper you. It only takes obedience to divine instructions and access to the mysteries of the kingdom to be blessed. There are seven of you here this evening that the Lord will give you a scepter for wealth. Hear me. When I was teaching, I didn't say you have to inherit money to be rich. Because if we get rich only by inheritance, then the law of natural selection will already determine the fate of certain people in poverty. He said, you shall remember the Lord your God. It is him that giveth thee the power to get wealth. There is a power to get wealth. It's not emotional. If that power comes upon you, it can take the route of favor. It can take the route of wisdom. It can take the route of hard work. It can take the route of inheritance. Anywhere at all, you will prosper. Whether you are sitting or standing, just stretch your hands towards me now. The Lord told me, He said, He will raise seven financial apostles. But I didn't just come to do an impartation. I came to give you the precepts and the ordinances so that everybody can benefit from it. He said he sent his word to Jacob. It lightened upon Israel. You may be a student. You may be a worker. You may be a businessman. You may be a politician. It takes a mantle. When it falls on you, regardless of what you are doing, you cannot but prosper. Can you ask the Lord now? Tell him you are open, you are ready. I invite you now to forget about the crisis and the things you have struggled with. There is something about to fall on someone and your story is about to change. Somebody will just break forth in the real estate business from one land to five lands to ten lands to buildings and to an estate because a weapon will be handed over tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, seven people you have ordained for power to get wealth. Hmm. Now, Lord, now, ushers, you will, you will bring those people here. I will start praying with them from tonight because there is something about to shift in their lives. In the name of Jesus, take that mantle. Where are the seven of them? On ground, on line. Take that grace now. Once again, let eternity be seen. Elohim Adonai.
They say, by me, kings reign and princes decree justice. There is a light that comes upon you that makes you a ruler. The Bible said, Job was the richest, the greatest of all men from the east. And in Job 29, verse 4, he says, As I was in the days of my youth, when the secrets of God was upon my tabernacle, there's a light about to hit somebody now. And that light is for wealth creation, wisdom for witty invention. In the name of Jesus, wherever you are, now I bring you that light. Take that light now.
your hand. I'm seeing God restoring somebody. You have touched money, but you left it. Money, you had touched money and influence, but something happened. I came to restore you by the priestly unction upon my life. In the name of Jesus, wherever you are, take that restoration. Take that restoration. The scepter that restores, I stretch it towards you. Take that grace now. your money has been withheld somewhere here you have been struggling to get your money back they've held your money down I use you as a point of contact to everybody homes finances are hanging except I am not called between now and the next seven days I command those padlocks break off your finances take your fortunes back in the name of Jesus He said, Thou shall lend to many nations and thou shall not borrow. There is an order of wealth that causes a man to become the solution and the salvation of a nation. As I speak under this unction, except God have not sent me. There are not less than three people here hearing me now. It may not look like there's nothing happening now. But between now and the next three years, you are one of those who will borrow to nations. In the name of Jesus, take that scepter now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You have heard me tonight. Welcome to your season of rest. He said, I, I see an abomination under the sun. He said, princes are trekking while beggars are riding on horses. It will not be among us that that abomination will be proclaimed. Because you are under this atmosphere, because you are under this teaching tonight, the hand of God is upon you for wealth. And even you too will be part of those that make things happen by finances. Take that grace in the name of Jesus. Before this month is over, hear me. At least seven persons will touch one million for the first time. I am not psyching you. If that money comes to your hand, I insist that you testify. We may not bring you out publicly. But I insist that you testify. And as you make up your mind to be part of those who will testify. In the name of Jesus, step into the realm of millions. You will not work hard. And somebody else eats of the fruit of your labor. Your hands have worked. You will eat of the fruit of your labors.